As we continue on with our study of genetics, we'll now talk about gene mapping and gene expression. We talked in our last set of notes about linked genes, genes that are located on the same chromosome. You can use, you can, they have a tendency to be inherited together, but remember crossing over occurs during meiosis, and so genes that, that are on the same chromosome may be separated by crossing over. You can use, you can figure out the relative locations of genes on chromosomes by calculating recombination frequencies. The closer together they are, the less frequently are they separated, they are separated. And so the more frequently you see these two genes or these two traits expressed in the same individual, the closer they probably are together. But if you see the traits separated, um, then that means they're usually farther apart. This is something we're not going to calculate in pre-AP biology, but in a AP biology, you could do some calculation on those kinds of things. This just gives you an idea of how it happens. So here's a section of chromosome with linked genes. Okay, we have three different genes here, G, C, and L. That uh, from G to C, you only see those recomb recombined about 9% of the time. And from C to L, you see those recombined about 9, 9.5% of the time. But G and L, you see recombined about 17% of the time. So you can figure out that they are farther apart because you see them separated more frequently than you do the other two pairs, which are closer together. Uh, again, we're not going to calculate that in pre-AP biology, but you need to know that it can happen, that you can use those uh, that information to, um, to figure out how far apart genes are located on the same chromosome. Another thing we need to discuss is gene expression. The definition in your book for gene expression is the process whereby genetic information flows from genes to proteins. That means from genotype to phenotype. Gene expression is regulated by turning genes on and off as needed by the cell. Not all cells need all genes to be expressed all the time. And the way this happens is different between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Let's just think about that for a minute, okay? All of your genes have gene, all of your cells have genes for the same traits, the same characteristics. And I've told you before that a lot of most genes are just strictly uh, coding for various kinds of proteins. Some of the proteins may be structural proteins, some of them may be enzymes that catalyze reactions and so forth. And so let's say you have a gene for um, insulin. Now, all of, your, all of your cells have the gene to produce insulin, but not all of your cells produce insulin. Insulin is only produced by certain cells in the pancreas gland of your body, and it's not produced by every cell in the pancreas gland, only certain kinds of cells that are found there. In all other cells, that gene is turned off. It is only turned on in the gene, in the cell, specific cells of your pancreas gland that produce insulin. That's what we mean by gene expression and gene regulation. So a lot of what we know about gene expression is from studying bacteria like E. coli, okay? And so we're going to talk about prokaryotic gene expression and how that works, and then we'll talk a little bit more about eukaryotic expression. So in prokaryotes, you find clusters of genes with related functions. Remember, prokaryotes have only one chromosome. Okay, so they're much simpler. They don't have a lot of different things to keep track of, but they have to take care of, all, since they are single cells, they have to take care of all of the needs of the cell in one cell. Okay, so they have these clusters of genes called operons, and the operons are controlled by various kinds of, of um, molecules. Okay, the control sequences include promoters and operators as well as repressors, and I'm going to give you definitions of what those terms are. A control sequence is the DNA section that helps control the operon. It's, in other words, it's the switch that turn it on or off, or that, that controls whether it is expressed or whether it is not. A promoter is where the RNA polymerase attaches. Now, in these operons, you have an operator, which is basically the on-off switch. If the operator is on, then the gene will be expressed, and the, and the DNA will be um, will be um, translated and tra transcribed and translated, and if the operator is off, then it won't. Uh, and oftentimes the operators are turned off by means of something called a repressor. A repressor is a molecule which binds to the operator and physically blocks the RNA polymerase from, from attaching. 
if RNA polymerase can't attach, then you can't transcribe the DNA sequence into messenger RNA, and therefore you're not going to get the protein made. Here's a diagram. This is from your book, and this stuff is covered in Chapter 11 of your textbook if you want to read a little bit more about it. And there is a reading assignment related to this. So in this case, we're talking about the lac operon. The lac operon refers to the sugar lactose. Okay, Lactose is a sugar that can be utilized by some cells when it is present. But it's not always present. Think about it. E. coli lives in your intestinal tract. Okay, And if you don't drink much milk, then you don't, your E. coli don't get exposed to a whole lot, much, a whole lot of lactose. It's not necessary for them to make the um, genes to utilize the lactose sugar unless lactose is present. Okay, and so, so the lat in in the case of E. coli, the lac operon is turned off unless lactose is present. So here we have the regulatory gene and the promoter, which is where the RNA polymerase is attached, the operator, which is the switch, and here's the repressor. The re when the repressor is in place, that means lactose is absent. There is no lactose present. And so therefore, RNA polymerase can't attach here and it can't, can't um, translate or transcribe those genes to produce the proteins for lactose utilization. But when lactose is present, lactose binds with the repressor, which inactivates the repressor, removes it from the operator, and therefore, the RNA polymerase can attach to the, to the operator and trans, transcribe the DNA sequence to be translated into the proteins, which are the enzymes that are needed for the utilization of lactose sugar. That's basically the way it works in bacteria. It's a little bit different in eukaryotes. Multicellular eukaryotes like us undergo cell differentiation to produce lots of different cell types. Remember, you started off as one fertilized egg, zygote, and now you're made of trillions of cells. And then not only are you made of trillions of cells, you're made of several, a number of different kinds of cells. Each cell type has a specific program for expressing the genes that are needed for that particular kind of cell in response to various developmental signals. This can be various hormones that may be present at different times. It can be chemicals. It can be lots of different kinds of things. The differences between the cell types are because of the selective gene expression related to a lot of different factors that are involved here. All of your body cells, like I said before, don't need to make um, insulin. Only these specific islet cells of the pancreas are, are produce that. And so it's turned off, that's genes are turned off in the other cells. Some factors that affect just selective gene expression are called, are, uh, there are a number of them. Here are a couple, okay. DNA packing can block DNA expression. You know, DNA has to be packed pretty tightly to fit into the nucleus of the cells. And so the more tightly the DNA is packed, uh, the RNA polymerase can be prevented from attaching to the DNA because of the tight packing of the DNA. And the DNA is packed differently in different kinds of cells. Another thing that can affect selective gene expression is chemical modifications. The additions of various chemical groups like methyl groups to some amino acids or to some nitrogen bases can prevent gene expression or enhance gene expression. It can turn it on, basically, or turn it off. There are a number of different factors that are involved here, much more complex than we need to go into. The main thing that you need to know is that not every gene is expressed in every cell and that it can be controlled by various factors. Now, there's also something called epigenetic inheritance. This is inheriting traits that are transmitted by things that are not directly involved with the DNA sequence. And this, there's a video that I want you to watch about this. It's a SciShow video, and there is a Google Doc that you need to um, complete along with that. And there will be a little quiz over epigenetics. It's very, very interesting, and they're learning a lot more about this. Um, chemical modifications to the chromatin, like adding those methyl groups to the, um, to the um, sugars on the DNA, they don't affect the DNA sequence, but they can influence the inheritance of those kinds of traits. Epigenetics can also affect, may help explain differences between identical twins. There are lots and lots of things they're learning. This is one of the newest areas of genetic study. 
these days is epigenetic inheritance. Another important thing is X chromosome inactivation. Now I've told you before, an individual can't survive without one X chromosome. Females have two X chromosomes, but both of them aren't needed. You can get along just fine with one as we see from 50% of the population, which is male, which only have one X chromosome. So in female mammals, one of those X chromosomes in each body cell is chemically modified and highly compacted and becomes inactive. This in, in humans, when you look at the uh, when you look at cells, oftentimes you can see something called a bar body, and that is the inactivated X chromosome. Which X chromosome is inactivated depends on lots of different things. It's just basically random in embryos, which one gets turned off. But in all cells descended from that embryonic cell will have the same copy of the X chromosome turned off. This is important when there are different alleles for the genes that are present on the X chromosome. And I'm going to give you an example of that based on cats. Okay? Tortoiseshell cats are cats that have two colors of fur. Now in cats, the colors of the color of fur uh, the gene for colors is located on the X chromosome. So here we have a cat that has um, an allele for orange fur and an allele for black fur. We probably had an orange tabby crossed with a black cat. Okay, And so you have one X chromosome that has the orange gene and one X chromosome that has the black gene. So as the embryo develops, various random cells will turn off one chromosome or the other. So here we have two basic cell populations that are present in the cat, okay? This one has the orange fur gene active and produces orange fur wherever you see the patches of orange. And this one has the black fur gene that is active. And so you see black fur in the areas where that gene is active. That's how you end up with cats with different colors. So X and excavation is a very important uh, concept of something that happens in gen genetics as well. This concludes the notes on genetics and um, we will finish up this week in class.